Secret Theodore dark... Seuss Geisel, aka Dr. Seuss, which originally is supposed to be pronounced Dr. Seuss, but I'm not going to say that because there's probably only like five people on the planet who pronounce it that way, and Geisel himself eventually switched to the anglicized version. Dr. Seuss was one of the most famous and successful children's book authors and illustrators in the world, with his books selling more than half a billion copies. And for many of us, his works produced cherished childhood memories. And while his use of language and his storytelling abilities are something to be admired, his artwork was also a memorable and integral part to his stories. Dr. Seuss's signature wacky, gravity-defying art style is unmatched in its uniqueness. And while we all know Dr. Seuss mainly for his excellent children's books, animations, and the maybe not so excellent films made after his death, there are many artworks that are not as known but still definitely worth talking about. Dr. Seuss began as a cartoonist in the 1920s for magazines and other publications, such as Life and Vanity Fair. In 1931, Dr. Seuss illustrated a book called The Pocket Book of Boners. <coughs> At the time, boner did not have the sexual connotation it has today, and originally meant a silly mistake. It was a humorous book full of illustrations, and was one of the best-selling paperbacks of World War II. This book was actually a collection of four books titled Boners, More Boners, Still More Boners, Prize Boners, and then even more compilations were released titled The Omnibus Boners and The Second Omnibus Boners. That's, That's awesome. That's a lot of boners. In 1937, Ted Geisel wrote and illustrated his first children's book, And to Think I Saw It on Mulberry Street, which had lackluster sales but garnered glowing reviews because of its imaginative story and visuals. Around the 1930s, Dr. Seuss collected things like antlers and other leftovers from dead animals, which his father Raw doll apologize for children's authors anti-semitism. In 1983, Dahl reportedly told Britain's New Statesman magazine, "There's a trait in the Jewish character that does provoke animosity. Even a stinker like Hitler didn't just pick on them for no reason." Wow. Did you guys maybe? Were you thinking about this guy when you thought you were talking about Dr. Seuss? Because you were like fucking, you were like, nah, dude, Dr. Seuss is a piece of shit. I'm like, doesn't seem like it, dude. <laughs> like, he, he just, I don't know anything, but it feels like he just, you know, drew some racist shit every now and then and, and, and then was no longer racist. Like, he just grew out of it would send him as he worked at the Springfield Zoo. He would take these parts, combine them with paper mache and paint, and transform them into busts of fictional creatures. He called the eventual 18 sculptures that would result from this process unorthodox taxidermy. Some of my favorites have to be the goo-goo-eyed Tasmanian wool ghast, the mulberry street unicorn, the sea-going dilemma fish, and the sawfish. That one has a surprisingly normal title. Later, but still pretty early in his career, he what became a political cartoonist, and during World War II produced over 400 cartoons. The funny thing about these drawings is that many of them contain creatures and caricatures that are very familiar to the wacky animals later seen in his children's books. So hey, by the way, all of these are anti-Nazi. Isolation ostrich, GOP, he's a noisy little so-and-so, but he's sweetheart, he's all ours. It gets very surreal when you see something like Horton representing the GOP, and Adolf Hitler drawn in his signature whimsical style. But just to be absolutely clear, Dr. Seuss was- Once in America first? Yeah. It's against. It's against America first, dumbass. The funny thing about these- He's literally against- many Every single one of these are anti-racist, and he's literally and fucking making fun of them. Familiar to the America first, Nazi fascist, communist. Oh, he was a, of course, dude. Every motherfucker, every intellectual of the time, anti-communist. Three arrows, Andy, dude. Wacky animals later seen in his children's books. So it gets very surreal when. It you actually, Loki kind of makes sense though. 
see something like Horton representing the GOP, and Adolf Hitler drawn in his signature whimsical style. But just to be absolutely clear, Dr. Seuss was very- How? I don't know. Think about- Think about your criticisms of the United States of America. Right now. Now think about your criticisms of China. I wouldn't go out of my way to be like, oh, I'm anti-China or anything like that, but the USSR was the China of the time. Still has nothing to do with communism, but I guess that's what he uh, saw it as a representative as. Very opposed to fascism and American isolationism. Oh, here's the America First one. During He's making World fun War of II, but he wasn't always on the right side of history, especially when you highlight these two comics. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, these are, these are spicy. These are very spicy. Of course, you have to keep in mind the time period when these depictions were acceptable. And yes, he did support the Japanese internment camps at the time, but clearly his ideas changed quite a bit later on. The yeah, camps see, at the look. time. But clearly, Horton here is who published in 1954 about an elephant that hears the text packet does, popular by tiny people. The book's hopeful, inclusive refrain a person is a person, no matter how small, is about as far as you can get from the ignoble words about the Japanese a decade earlier. He even dedicated the book to my great friend Mitsugi Nakamura of Kyoto, Japan. Clearly, his ideas changed quite a bit later on. These political cartoons, while interesting, are not as polished or witty as the children's books he would later write. Dr. Seuss's art style has remained very consistent throughout pretty much all of his career. To demonstrate this, you can take a quick glance at any of the advertisements that he illustrated and immediately recognize his signature style. Anything from Ford, to Standard Oil, to a detailed drawing of Hell for General Electric. I cannot understate how unique and recognizable Ted Geisel's art style was. His figures are simple. Dude, some of you cannot shed yourself. You know how some people can't shed themselves of their debate lord ways? Even if their ideology changes? Some of you literally can't shed yourself of your previous, like, cancel culture heavy ways either. Like, it's, it's like, you come from all different walks of life on the internet, all different corners of the internet. Some of you are, like, ex-fucking debate lords, and some of you are, like, ex-cancel culture heavy lords. Like, cancel lords, sweat lords, whatever you want to call it. I mean, you're literally fucking mad at the person in, like, 1952, okay? Like, where, where is this energy? Like, where, why are you... Like, he's not saying, like, oh, I have an Asian friend, so I'm, I can't be racist against... I have a Japanese friend, so I can't be racist against Japanese. Like, he very clearly grew out of it. You're also, like... Expecting someone to have 2020 uh, understanding is also super dead. I mean, I don't even give a fuck. Like, I mean, fuck Dr. Seuss and fuck his artwork. But like, goddamn, dude, I have no, I have no appreciation for what he's done. I don't care. I've never consumed any of his shit. This entire conversation originally started because I was like, I don't know what the fuck Dr. Seuss or the Grinch is. Never apologize for the anti-black comic, though, Keg Wade. Actually, I don't know what his take is on that, but he's very clearly anti-racist. He looked, he made fucking political cartoons about black labor and white labor. And, and how they all have the same fucking interests. We just saw it. So clearly, he wasn't necessarily uh, as racist as he was once. Motherfucker is asking for him to apologize. Our warlord Stalin for the Victory Express. Now don't tip the red cap too much. You know how I hate Russians. Are Clive and set?
think being anti-Japanese is probably as expect as acceptable as being anti Bin Laden after 9-11. No, being anti-Japanese uh in that respect is not even anti Bin Laden. It's like being anti every Middle Eastern person is a terror like or assuming every Middle Eastern person is a terrorist. He's blaming the Russia for all of making fun of how much Soviets gave to fight the Nazis and how we didn't do shit. Um. going yet complicated plain and rounded droopy faces contrast with intricate cross hatching on things like clothes and fur his characters are very gestural and lively and his buildings and machinery are no different they often seem to defy gravity and rarely contain any straight lines the use of cross hatching and reliance on pen and ink along with the strategic flat colors seen in most of his books probably comes from his experience as a cartoonist, with the goal of keeping the interest of younger audiences. And combined with the ridiculous designs of his creatures and machines, they all form an identity that is overwhelmingly and undeniably Susian. While the rhymes, inventive made-up words, and timeless storytelling are the core of his children's books, the imagery he uses to bring that whimsical poetry into visual forms is essential to the experience of a Dr. Seuss work. And what makes this style more intriguing is when it's put into different situations, from political cartoons to taxidermy. But there is another collection of lesser-known Dr. Seuss art that I find the most interesting of them all. Dozens of paintings that Dr. Seuss made in private, and were not to be released until after his death. A collection he liked to call the Midnight Paintings. Uh -oh. What strikes most people first about these paintings is how different they are from uh -oh. his mainstream works. Wait. There's a lot more black. Can I show this? Um, I don't know. Like, if it's art, am I allowed to show? Like, I don't know if there's like dicks and shit in it. I just don't know. They aren't lose, just dark? Okay. For the record, most of the things that chat was crying about came out to be uh, silly as fuck. Sorry. Black and other colors in these works, and many of them have a more ethereal quality. Clearly, these paintings were made for more emotive and leisure goals rather than storytelling ones. It's hard to summarize the many paintings he produced behind closed doors, so it's really best to approach them case by case. These secret Dr. Seuss works have a variety of styles and subjects. This painting, titled Cat Detective in the Wrong Part of Town, is reminiscent of Cubist works, but with brighter colors and typical Seussian architecture. A few other paintings contain a similar style, but for subjects like resorts. Others are more dramatic, forcing the viewer into unorthodox perspectives like this Dutch angle view of blobs of color leaping out of a brightly colored ocean, or this drastically curved landscape that seems to extend for infinity. Some are entirely abstract. Others are more pattern-based, like this painting of dozens of working-class birds walking up and down, made to express Geisel's economic concerns. Then this painting, a plethora of cats, was made for a simple reason, to show a lot of cats. But more specifically as a form of relaxation to see how many cats he could paint in, and how many are on this one canvas exactly? 392. A more satirical set of works called the La Jolla Bird Women resulted from Geisel people-watching from his La Jolla Tower studio. These thin bird folk were made to gently poke fun at his neighbors, and as you would expect, they are quite simple. They're women, but birds. The works I think are most interesting are the ones that are darker, both in color schemes and subject matter. A very simple painting titled Cat in Obsolete Shower Bath demonstrates the purely aesthetic choices of the darker paintings. The brush strokes and layering of color is erratic. There's no flat or smooth colors, just textural grungy spots forming the environment. The greenish yellow of the shower curtain is reminiscent of mold. There is speculation this is meant to represent how early in his life, Ted Geisel had to spend time in dingy one-room apartments. These overlapping gradients and textural painting is a far cry from the clean, calculated- I'm canceling him, dude.
He was a fucking furry. Just kidding. That was a joke. coloring of his children's books. And many of these paintings seem to represent a seedier, almost cynical aspect we didn't usually see in his art. One of my favorite paintings, Cat from the Wrong Side of the Tracks, seems to imply just from the title the subject is an inversion of the child-friendly cat in the hat. The face is more angular, his whiskers unkempt, and his aura is overall more sinister. To complement this, we get more Susian architecture but applied to a pool table, with a bunch of nonsense angles and extreme distortion. One of my favorite details is the beads above his head. Everyone knows the saying, a cat has nine lives, right? Well, let's just say that it seems eight of his beads are used up and there seems to be just one left. A similar painting, Indistinct Cat with Cigar, develops a theory that these cat representations could be something of an alter ego, considering that Dr. Seuss was a lifelong smoker. And just like how he never smoked where a child might see him, these paintings too remained hidden. It's hard to find any self-portraits of his that are positive or pleasant. One of them is quite blatantly titled, Self-Portrait of the Artist Worrying About His Next Book. So it seems to me some of these works might have been Dr. Seuss's version of vent art. Well, that's pro- Dude, this is sick. Like, his art was fucking sick. Thank you guys for telling me that Dr. Seuss was, um, racist as fuck and anti-Japanese. Because now I'm a fan of his. Not for those reasons, obviously, but probably an oversimplification, but you get what I mean. Probably one of the creepiest, darker paintings is Surly Cat being a gen- Now we got it. Now we, we went down this rabbit hole and, and I am familiar with his, with his uh, overall body of work. Ejected, where this grotesquely long cat is being sent away by this This video is biased and you know it? Almost faceless, mannequin-like woman in the dead of night. It's hard to pinpoint exactly why I find this work slightly unsettling, but I would guess it's the combination of all the uncanny and distorted elements. Of course, in contrast, there are many hopeful and bright paintings, such as this sunny seascape, full of roaring waves and the impossibly long tail of a bird being manipulated by the great swirls and fluctuations of the wind. The dynamic shapes that Geisel so masterfully produces gives this painting a great sense of energy and movement. Then there are paintings that walk a delicate middle ground between melancholy and hopefulness, such as the Great Cat Continuum, made during his later years. Dr. Seuss's cat seems to walk through an enormous line of windows from one experience to the next, each with slightly different shapes and distortions. There are a few with biblical meanings, such as this depiction of the Tower of Babel, or this cat named Joseph Katz, sporting a brightly colored outfit, clearly alluding to- Dude, this, bit, this, this video is nitpicky and biased. Bye-bye, I win. Didn't even say Dr. Seuss was racist once. Very clearly in the pocket of big doctors. Very clearly in the pocket of Big Dr. Seuss. Bye-bye, I win. ...to the story of Joseph and his brothers. But the ones that are my favorite come from a stage in the Midnight Paintings, often referred to as Geisel's Deco Period, referring to the black backgrounds and golden structures. The iconic and strange, asymmetrical, slightly organic architecture is illogical, almost alien, even more so than in his books because this time there is few basic structures to even signify something inhabitable, not even a window or roof. The only thing that is an indicator are the stairs, stairs that seem to lead nowhere. And when you have this architecture set in front of an almost pure black background, both with a single creature resting in the middle, you get this immense sense of isolation, abandonment even. It is difficult to assume that the people who built these structures are even living there anymore, but the creatures currently relaxing in these structures are happy. They are a beacon of life and hope, and that's why with this sense of isolation, you also get this immense sense of tranquility. Other deco paintings give off similar feelings, but not as intensely as these two. When I first heard about these secret paintings, I wanted to find some sort of code to crack. Some puzzle or hidden meaning behind these private works that could possibly unlock some of Dr. Seuss's genius, or give some magical window into the man's soul, or reveal some deep, dark secret. But of course, these paintings are a variety of things. 
none of them really gossip-worthy. And while they do reveal some sides to Ted Geisel that were previously unknown, they are also fun, humorous, and express his imagination just as well as in his books, but with more coloring and subject matter freedom. The many atmospheres and moods expressed in the Midnight Paintings are often different from his books, but I can say with utmost confidence, they are just as creative. Dude, dude, this person literally is like writing in, in Twitter speak. Watch, watch. He was racist as fuck, but he didn't, but didn't he like grow and learn? It's what Horton Hears a Who is about. Unless I'm mistaken, Horton Hears a Who is literally about Seuss recognizing he was racist as fuck and realizing that's fucked up and trying to move past it. Folks in here trying to pretend they're all woke from the start. Oh, never mind. I thought you were shitting on. Oh, my bad. I thought you were literally fucking shitting on him and being like, folks in here are trying to make it seem like he's woke from the start. My bad. I'm sorry were actually the one who was fucking appropriately calling out everyone yo let me just say something here no it's not a fire it's a misfire and i also immediately uh, walked it back listen 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 one of the most annoying traits of certain chatters Aside from like, uh, you know, immediately jumping on the fuck, Dr. Seuss is racist as fuck because I read a BuzzFeed article on how racist he is or some shit. One of the parts about this that really fucking uh, annoys me is people being like, oh, I just got back from peeing and like, you know, uh, having a meeting with my accountant on Christmas uh, evening and, and he's still on the stun lock. It's like, dude, that's the beauty of this fucking stream is that we go from a fucking Pawn Stars episode to like going down a rabbit hole for 25 to 30 minutes about Dr. Seuss and learning new things about fucking Dr. Seuss. Shut the fuck up. That's the whole point, dude. Go watch any number of other fucking React Andes if you just want someone to be like, oh, this is funny. Or like, I don't know, make like poop and dick jokes or something. Like, which by the way, I do that as well. <laughs> 